One of the most interesting aspects of speedrunning history is a game's development over time. While some games are instant classics, other games need more time to become fully realized. Almost like children, some games are late bloomers, accompanied by the same growing pains that come with the process of maturity. Ratchet & Clank 2 is one of these games. From an innocent start, to an explosion of developments, to finding its own place in the world around it and forging its own path forward, Ratchet 2 has been on one hell of a journey. Let's relive the life story of this space opera, a drama of amazing discoveries, cutthroat rivalries, and conquering oneself. Suit up and strap in, the show's about to start. Welcome to Speed Docs. Ratchet & Clank Going Commando, also known as just Ratchet & Clank 2, was released for the PlayStation 2 in November of 2003. A direct sequel to the original Ratchet & Clank, Going Commando builds on its predecessor with bigger guns, badder enemies, and a whole new adventure. Just like the first game, Ratchet comes equipped with his trusty wrench and an arsenal of crazy and bombastic weapons. The game is a mixture of a third-person shooter and an action platformer, following the dynamic duo across this new Bogon galaxy as they follow the trail of a stolen and dangerous prototype weapon. On their journey, Ratchet and Clank will visit a slew of new planets such as Maktar, Siberius, Todano, Bolden, Snivelak, and Yeetle. To help him, Ratchet has some new tech. Ratchet can now strafe side to side, a feature that was noticeably missing in the first game. Next, Ratchet can now dash forward with a burst of speed, thanks to his fancy new charge boots, which let players quickly navigate the larger levels. Ratchet also has access to a first-person mode after players complete the game at least one time, but we'll talk about that in a minute. For now, let's get started. As far back as 2007, players were aware that Ratchet & Clank 2 had quite a few fun and exploitable glitches. And just a few years after the game's release, players made message boards and YouTube videos all about the wacky and fun tricks that you could do. The really interesting glitches, though, were decoy clipping and first-person wrench climbing. Decoy clipping makes a return from the first game, allowing players to force Ratchet through thin walls using the pop-up balloons. Because the decoys have a large collision box and can be clustered together at Ratchet's feet, the decoys push Ratchet so far into the wall that the game just pushes him through. Players use this trick to get out of bounds or skip barriers, and essentially go wherever they please. First Person Mode was a new addition to the series, and was added as a special feature for players who beat the game and started a file in Challenge Mode, also known as New Game Plus. While players could always aim in first person while holding L1, this mode let players move around and play in that view the whole time. First person mode had an interesting oversight, a bug so spectacular that the developers found it and left it in because it was so fun. This bug was first person wrench climbing. While in first person, players could perform a double jump and then throw their wrench at a wall or surface and gain a bit of height. By simply mashing the square button after the double jump, players could continuously gain height as long as there was something to bounce off of. Wrench climbing was ridiculously easy to do, and let players climb any structure, wall, or landmass without issue. With the ability to clip through walls and scale large structures, players had a very powerful tool set at their disposal when it came to exploration. Even with these crazy tools, the first time we would see the power of these glitches in a speedrun is during the Marathon Summer Games Done Quick 2012. 
At this humble gathering of speedrun enthusiasts, a runner by the name of Deathfire321 shows off Ratchet & Clank going commando with a run of New Game Plus No Insomniac Museum Glitch. The caveat of No IMG was put in place to make the New Game Plus speedrun more interesting. One of the perks of playing on New Game Plus was having access to the Insomniac Museum from any point in the game. This was a huge oversight by the developers, because leaving the museum would always put Ratchet back on the planet Bolden, which is roughly six planets away from the end of the game. Since the specials menu let players warp to Bolden at any point, skipping the first two-thirds of the game was free. Runners already had all the gear they needed to complete the rest of the game, so the museum shortcut felt like a cheap time save and made the category too short. As such, the No IMG category was created to showcase the majority of the game while still being fast and flashy. Deathfire shows off plenty of tricks as he makes his way through the game. Using the charge boots, Deathfire moves around the levels at high speeds. He also uses wrench climbing frequently and gracefully floats over any obstacles in his way. Taking a bit of a scenic route, he shows off some of the funny cutscenes in Cool Planets, like here on Bolden. Since he has access to all of the endgame weapons, Deathfire mostly uses the Rhino, the homing missile launcher, to dispatch most of the enemies in his way. For the big boss on the planet Snivelak, Deathfire uses the Rhino until he runs out of ammo, and switches to some other powerful weapons like the Mini Nuke and the Synthenoids. The fight takes him a while, but he gets the job done. Deathfire avoids a long side quest to multiple planets in order to collect the Hypnomatic Gadget by simply wrench climbing over this ledge to the end of Grelbin. Deathfire saved himself a silly amount of time with this one little skip. Lastly, Deathfire skips the majority of the Yidel exterior by going around this outer ring to clip inside the enemy base. In the end, Deathfire finishes his marathon run in 56-10. Critters! Yay. The final loss is like uh, a play of Critters. Yes, nice. I beat a minute, an hour. <laughs> I beat a minute! <laughs> yeah. Best speedrun ever! Oh. Let's watch these cutscenes. Deathfire's run was a cool display of the game's glitches and tricks, but with his run being the first of its kind, sloppy mistakes were bound to happen. For instance, Deathfire made an extensive detour to visit the planet in Daco to gather up Clank and to collect the swing shot and grind boots. Runners on popular speedrunning forums had already discovered that you could skip all of these items. Also, while he was using the charge boots to move around quickly, Deathfire was playing on the later released Greatest Hits version, which patched out the ability to spam the boots to maintain the fastest speed. Some of his planets were also noticeably slow, like Notak, where he messed up the wrench climb so badly he had to reload the level, and Needle, where his roundabout exploration cost him several minutes. Rack 2 would go eerily quiet after this run. Deathfire just disappeared, never to be heard from again. While the community saw an opportunity for a better run, no one published another speedrun for quite some time. The Ratchet & Clank speedrunning community was still rather small, and the runners in it were more focused on the first and third game in the series. Plenty of developments were being made in those games, but who would push Rack 2? Almost two years would go by before we see any more activity. At the start of 2014, runner FS Tenonator submitted a faster time to the speedrun.com leaderboard, a 49 flat on January 18th. A step in the right direction, FS mimics a lot of Deathfire's marathon run, but performs a little more smoothly. There were a few notable changes though. On Davo, FS clips through a wall at the start of this area, and skips the entire level that Deathfire had to play through normally. He also skipped the tractor beam on Uzla, which is normally used to take down the barrier on Maktar. Instead, FS uses a wrench climb to simply skip over it. It's also notable that FS was playing on the PS3 version of the game, which was built off of the greatest hits version that Deathfire played on. The PS3 version has faster loads, but also suffers from a few patches that get in the way of speedruns. While this run wasn't exactly revolutionary, it was a sign of the future. Not long after this run, runners and glitch hunters Cypress and Insomniac Nintendo also took a crack at Rack 2. The two had experience in the other two games in the original trilogy, and were best equipped to take on Rack 2. 
Bringing their unique perspectives and route ideas to the table, these two found plenty of route changes and started trimming down on the excess. The two would trade the record back and forth as they started optimizing the route, until Cypress would score a 35-11 on May 18, 2014. The game was slowly taking shape and beginning to resemble an actual speedrun. To avoid time loss from excessive menuing, Cypress played the vast majority of the run in first-person mode. It also helped him start his wrench climbs faster and gave him more control over the charge boots. He also completely skipped picking up Clank, saving several minutes by not going to Indaco. Without the grind boots or the swing shot, Cypress makes use of wrench climbing to navigate the terrain that normally requires the gadgets, like the train on Siberius and the large gap on Tabora. Cypress also does another major skip on Tabora. Halfway through the level, there's a cutscene that gives the coordinates to the next planet, but Ratchet's ship is busted. Instead of collecting 10 crystals for the Mystic to fix his ship, it's faster to just use the specials menu to warp to the Barlow hoverbike race. Back on Barlow, the ship works just fine and Cypress can go to the next planet. Cypress also takes a very different approach to the boss on Snivelak. Instead of fighting the boss head on, Cypress enters the boss arena from the back. Utilizing a quick wrench climb to get over the doors, Cypress takes a path that the game isn't expecting. In doing so, the boss is loaded into the arena, but isn't activated yet because the cutscene hasn't started. This lets Cypress casually walk up and use the Sheepinator weapon to beat the boss after about 35 seconds. Finally, by skipping the grind boots, Cypress saves time on Smolg as well. Without the grind boots, players can just walk along the grind rail to grab the coordinates for Grelbin, instead of playing through the level normally. With all these major changes, the route was now a whopping 15 minutes faster and significantly more refined. Ian would soon catch up and got his best time down to a 3508 using basically the same tricks as Cypress. Together, the two had really whipped the run into shape. There were now no extra planets in the route and no more items that could have been skipped. It was time for the real work to begin. But as soon as the groundwork was laid out, the larger Ratchet and Clank speedrunning community became more interested in running the first and third game in the trilogy. Rack 2 was left in the dust, and would have to wait patiently for its time in the limelight. But, unbeknownst to the community, a storm was coming. A wind of change. One that would alter the course of Ratchet speedrunning forever. The Ratchet and Clank speedrunning community was still budding. Even when combining the runners from all of the first three games, the headcount was barely over 20 people. Feeling curious one day, Ratchet 1 runner Nuka set out to see if anyone else was speedrunning Ratchet and Clank anywhere else in the world. Nuka went to Nico Video, a Japanese video site, and looked up Ratchet and Clank speedrun in Japanese. Nuka didn't know it at the time, but he had struck gold. This guy Nuka, who was uh, a very, very good Ratchet and Clank runner of the first game, he decided to look up just to see if anybody else was playing Ratchet and Clank in like anywhere else in the world. Because from our current knowledge, the only thing we knew was that we had some European runners and we had some American runners. So he went to Nico Video, which is like kind of like the Japanese, you know, YouTube, and he typed in Ratchet and Clank speedrun in, in Japanese, and he quite literally hit the jackpot. He found this one run, it was a Ratchet and Clank up your arsenal, New Game Plus run, by this guy's silence. And the run was seriously beyond anything that we had ever done in the West. I mean, just how fast he went, it changed the entire metagame, like, for good. What Nuka found was astonishing. Silence's 3746 and Ratchet and Clank 3 blew the community's minds. Not only was there another runner that they didn't know about, he was way, way better than they thought was even possible. In fact, they could hardly believe their eyes. It was like he was playing a completely different game. Silence had found a way to bring the crazy movement techniques from Rack 3's multiplayer mode into its single player mode. Ratchet 3, Up Your Arsenal, or Ouya, was the first game in the series to include an online multiplayer mode. In it, Teams of players would zoom around an open map, blasting each other or capturing objectives. You know, classic multiplayer stuff. 
As the years went on, the online community had gotten really good at the game. Like, really good. In practically no time, multiplayer matches were turning into high-octane gunfights with heavy movement tech utilized. This mainly came in the form of lag jumping, where inputting a side flip would preserve the speed from the charge boots, allowing players to move around quickly while being a small target to hit in the process. This was no secret though. YouTube was filled with videos of montages and highlights of cool maneuvers and crazy plays. But the problem was, trying to perform these techniques in the single player mode just didn't have the same result. Multiplayer was slightly different with its movement mechanics. While it was possible to perform lag flips in single player, runners weren't able to turn or change directions like they could in multiplayer. Runners were stuck going in a straight line, so it just didn't help them all that much. But Silence had found the best of both worlds. He had discovered new techniques exclusive to single player that built on the online tricks. Single player movement had some unique advantages over multiplayer, namely access to Clank and his Hellion thruster pack moves. With Clank and the full arsenal of weapons that single player has, Silence had spent a lot of time developing even more techniques that the other runners had never even dreamed of, culminating in a run that shattered all expectations. Um, when Nuka discovered it, I mean, it literally caused an earthquake and just shattered how we thought the game was supposed to be ran. Like, we had to adapt to a whole new way of, of running things. That silence run is seriously, like, one of the biggest things that's happened for this, for, the, for this whole series. Some of the major techniques that silence was using were neutrals and whip jumps. Neutrals form the basis of advanced grounded movement. While charging forward, it's possible to cancel the charge by firing a weapon, tapping L1, and leaving the control stick in the neutral position to maintain the speed gained from the charge boots for a brief duration. While in this neutral state, players can perform side flips, long jumps, or wrench swings to continue or redirect the initial charge's momentum. This allows runners to cross huge gaps or maintain top speed around corners and obstacles. While neutrals have the grounded movement covered, other techniques like whip jumps were used in the air to clear unfathomable distances. At the end of a charge while mid-air, if you hold L1, there's a small window to input a swing from Ratchet 3's Plasma Whip weapon. After swinging the whip, the game mistakenly thinks that Ratchet is grounded and allows you to perform a long jump while mid-air, all while maintaining the full speed of the charge. To finish it off, players could also perform a hyper strike at the end of that long jump to gain a little extra height and distance. Silence's run shook the Ratchet community to their core. By comparison, all the other runners looked like clowns, cheap imitations of the real thing. In a word, fraudulent. You might hear people say things as strongly as everyone's movement was fraudulent until uh, until Silence came around. And, and to some, I actually agree for the most part. I mean, I think that Silence really kind of showed uh, the the level to which we didn't even come close to understanding the games, which is kind of insane that any one person could push the meta of an entire community so far, it, almost exclusively by himself. While shocked, it was also inspiring at the same time. Most of the community attempted to analyze, understand, and adopt Silence's techniques. What they soon found out was, since Rack 2 had such similar movement mechanics to Rack 3, around 80% of the movements seen in Silence's Ouya run also applied to Rack 2, specifically to the original Black Label PS2 version. While the Plasma Whip was a new weapon in Rack 3, whip jumps could still be performed in Rack 2 with a regular wrench swing. Suddenly, the second game in the trilogy went from living in its sibling's shadows to standing tall with the rest of them. So once that got discovered that it worked on Black Label, that's where it was kind of like, wait, this game doesn't suck. <laughs> that's a really poor way to word it, but it was like, it was very limited in what you were able to do before because you had very limited neutral tech of what you could do and first person climbing. So the Ouya multiplayer's discoveries is what I'd say is the beginning of modern Rack 2 speedrunning. The reason the Silence's run is so significant to Ratchet 2 over Rack 1 is because of the charge boots. Everything that you could do in Ouya, basically, you could also do in Rack 2, like more or less. 
Around mid-2015, very few players would be able to learn, adopt, and replicate the extremely technical movement that Silence had found. However, three players would rise above the rest. These three were IN, ZEM92, and the Rixer. Rack 3 was seeing a lot of activity throughout mid-2015, and all three of these players couldn't get enough. IN would go back and forth between the two games from time to time, but was heavily disadvantaged in Rack 2. Due to having a greatest hits copy of the game, several of the new movement techniques were patched out. On the other hand, Zem was already heavily invested in Up Your Arsenal from running the game since 2013. Because of this, Zem would be too focused on Ouya to bother with going Commando, meaning Ricky was the only person with the right version of the game and the skill to push the game to the next level. Someone had to bring that movement into Ratchet 2, and so it was either pretty much the top three at the time, uh, which was in, in 2015, I'm pretty sure it was it was Zem, it was IN, and it was me. So it was either of any of us. Uh, I think Zem was too obsessed with Up Your Arsenal. IN had a super scuffed copy of Going Commando, which I still want to play on someday. And then there was me. And, you know, I think having achieved my goal in Up Your Arsenal, I set out to optimize Going Commando from where it had barely even been started. Uh, no IMG was just a new category at the time, and it was just my quest to lower it. A year after discovering Silence, Ratchet 2 was barely any faster than where we left it. Since IN's 3508 back in July of 2014, IN had lowered the record to a 3503 in July of 2015. Because he couldn't implement the new movement techniques, the game hadn't benefited from Silence's run, yet. Seeing an opportunity to shine, Ricky stepped in. Known for his faster no matter what mentality, Ricky is a stickler for optimization. After making waves and setting good times in regular NG+, Ricky set his sights on no IMG. Since IN and Cypress had laid out the groundwork already, Ricky had his work cut out for him. Starting out, Ricky beat the world record three times in the same week, each time shaving another minute off the run. Starting on July 28th, Ricky gets a 34.52, then a 33.53, and lastly, a 32.42. Alright, that's an okay run. 31 next though, but yeah, finally, all right, we got that 32 that I wanted a day ago. Definitely not too bad, but definitely not too good either. A lot of mistakes. 31's pretty free. His superior movement would absolutely crush the competition, and there was no one stopping him. The people who ran Ouya had a huge leg up on the people who only ran Rack 2, because we had to compete against Silence. And so if you wanted to be good at, at Ouya, you had to learn all this ridiculous movement tech at the time. And so Ricky, he, he got world record in Ouya any percent, uh, I believe only one time. Um, and largely he was kind of behind the curve. He, I, if I recall correctly, he was always like a step or two below the top people in Ouya NG+. But even that was already good enough for him to come into Rack 2 with his knowledge of Ouya movement and just absolutely destroy everyone. Uh, because nobody else had movement nearly as refined as the Ouya runners back then when it came to Rack 2 stuff. So Ricky comes in with all of his Ouya knowledge and, and just within like a week or two of, of running the category just blows everyone out of the water. Because he was so far ahead of the pack, he was in a league of his own as such, it was entirely up to him to find new strategies and time saves. Most of me just grinding down these like minutes, uh, like I, ha I hate to put it blunt, but it was mostly just a, like a one man effort kind of thing. Like, sure, I've been taught all these things from uh, from Zem and IN and, and Silence and stuff in, in Ouya, but when I went to going commando, routing out the movement for all these different planets was like all me. Like I had to do basically all of it and it resulted in the times getting as low as they did because of like i was basically the only one playing going commando with the knowledge of all the ouya movement that was available ricky already had a good eye for movement so he had no problems there it was time to find some skips and find them he would on bolden there was this huge huge first person climb you do up the clock tower and then you charge all the way over the dome 
and then you go into the end ending and you talk to Mr. Fizz Widget. And I was like, what if there's a way to get to Mr. Fizz Widget like a lot faster? Instead of climbing the tower, Ricky tried to find an alternate way of getting to the end. I don't know how much this would save if you got it instantly, but I, I'm willing to bet somewhere in the 15 second range. If not more, actually. Alright, let's try and replicate it. If it's consistent. <laughs> oh, it's consistent. 100%. Ha! <laughs> ha! Oh my god. I can't believe that's possible. This was a pretty big discovery, saving around 30 seconds. Similarly, Ricky also found a faster clip on Dabo that also saved him a bit of time. Ricky would also utilize a technique on Feltzen that Cypress had found, known as Nuke Storage. By firing the nuke on the first wave of enemies, and then restarting the mission on a specific frame of the explosion, you can move on to the second wave but keep the nuke in your inventory. Quickly blasting both waves saves well over 15 seconds, and can be retried if missed. With these new skips and more, Ricky was ready to keep pushing. Ricky gets back on the grind in August. With all of the work he's put in, Ricky was confident that he could get the time all the way down to sub 30. With about two and a half minutes to go, Ricky had some serious work to do. After weeks of grinding and a month of practicing, routing, and innovating on his own, Ricky achieved a 2934 on September 5th, 2015. It's over! Yeah! Yeah! Fuck yeah! No IMG's done! Ugh! 2934! Bitch! Get the fuck out of here! We're done with this shit! Yeah! Oh! Fucking hype, dude. Fuck yeah, man. Get the fuck in there. We are in there. Ricky was happy with where he ended up. A pretty clean run with all of the tricks he knew of. He was aware that a 28-minute time was within reach, but was satisfied with his time and was ready to move on. Without Ricky, Rack 2 would lay in wait once again. On the bright side, Ricky's efforts had shown the community that Rack 2 still had a ton of potential. The game was ripe for the picking, if anyone wanted to put in the work. With a huge milestone being reached, who was going to pick up the wrench and grind the time down further? Kitty time is over. Five months after Ricky's departure, another top runner comes in to clean up Rack 2. We've mentioned him before, this time it's Rack 3's wonder child, Zem92. Zem was at the forefront of Up Your Arsenal speedrunning for well over a year and had been running the game since 2013, before Silence's run was discovered. A fierce competitor, Zem trained continuously to not only learn, but master the advanced movement. After a long climb, Zem had reached the summit, and had finally surpassed Silence and Up Your Arsenal, taking his movement to new heights. Zem's success had boosted his confidence, while also inflating his ego. He had the right to be confident. He had handedly beaten Silence's legendary time, developed his own techniques, and was a master in his own right. As such, Zem carried with them an air of bravado. Zem was arguably the best ratchet speedrunner in the world, and he damn well knew it. And he was going to make sure you knew it too. After Ricky had departed, the community was starting to pick up the pieces and catch up to his times. Zem saw an opportunity to flex. 
Zem took a break from being the fastest Ouya runner to stunt on the GC crew. Taunting his competitors by constantly telling people how he didn't need to practice this game, Zem was quickly becoming quite the antagonist. Zem would even wear the snowman costume on Ratchet, which was notoriously hard to play with since it obscured Ratchet's feet, making precise movement that much more difficult to pull off. But that was kind of like, that was kind of my MO early on in my in my time of running Rack 2 is that I was very adamant about kind of BMing the Rack 2 community because I came in as as the hotshot Ouya runner who kind of just shat on everybody. Um, I, I was, I was, in many ways, I was very, very full of myself back then, and and, it, and I do kind of feel bad about it. But um, but I remember I, I was uh, I was very vocal about never practicing rack two stuff. Like I I would practice Ouya for hours and hours whenever I would run Ouya, but I would always talk about how um, yeah like oh I don't practice rack two. Practicing rack two is for losers. Like I just shit on everybody anyway. I don't need to practice. But all of Zem's theatrics were not in vain. Since most of the techniques transferred over from Rack 3, Zem was amazing at Rack 2 as well. Zem already had a better fundamental game and just better speed. I think we probably had around the same fundamentals, but his speed in Up Your Arsenal was ridiculous. He also just had way more hours on me in Up Your Arsenal. So when he finally came to going Commando, I mean, it was just no surprise. I mean, he just, he was the goat of Uya and if my time was just going to sit there and do nothing and no one's going to try and challenge it, of course it's going to be either Zem or Ian, and Ian is uh, not doing it anytime soon with that copy of his, so I mean Zem picked it up and uh, yeah, he started destroying, destroying the game completely. After catching up to Ricky, Zem wasted no time getting a 29-19 on February 18th, 2016. Oh my god, man. Holy fucking shit. <sighs> and soon followed up with a 2850 just a few days later. As the year was coming to a close, Zem got Going Commando into Awesome Games Done Quick 2017 as a race between himself and another runner, Skits. While warming up for his submission, Zem got a 2746 on October 7th just by playing really well. Zem was on fire, and while he joked about not practicing the run, it was clear that he was very dedicated to this pursuit. His opponent, Skits, wasn't far behind him. Skits ended the year with a 2808 himself. The race at AGDQ was going to be interesting. While Zem was the better player, Skits was known to put up quite a fight. On most occasions, Skits would pull ahead of Zem in certain parts of the run, but would often drop it by the end. The two were very capable runners and raced frequently towards the end of 2016. As a sort of gentleman's agreement, both Zem and Skits vowed to not practice the run until they arrived at the event in person to try to keep things interesting. Nothing like a little rust to keep the competition fresh. Unfortunately, the race at the event was not as close as Skits was hoping. While explaining the tricks in the early game, Skits made several mistakes and lost time in some of his best sections of the run. With his fastest times now lost, Zem took an early lead and never let up. The race was still an interesting showcase, but Zem's consistency and prowess was on full display as he took the win at the end of the day. And time. Okay. Clap yeah. nice. <laughs> louder. Ah. Louder. <laughs> After the event, Zem went back to working on Ouya, while Skits started a new job. For his work, Skits moved across the globe to Japan, where he took on a job teaching English. Adjusting to his new life, Skits kind of dropped off the map. But looming over his head, Skits wasn't happy with the outcome of the AGDQ race. Skits was very down in the dumps about losing this race, especially the way that he did. And uh, so what ended up happening was, that was kind of his uh, his last time in the States for a while because he was going to, it was like a, a six month teaching program in Japan where he, he went to Japan to teach English to people who were learning English as a second language. But uh, it was hard for him to kind of, you know, keep up with all of us in the speedrunning community. And we were, you know, some of his closest friends and 
And uh, so he kind of took that time to look a little bit inwards and he kind of said, you know, I, I don't really want to go out, have my Rack 2 legacy just be me coming close and then losing. I kind of want to prove that I can still, I still have it in me to compete with the big boys. While he couldn't exactly ask for a rematch, he could at least do something to show that he meant business. Left to stew in a different hemisphere, Skits was dedicating the little free time he had to grinding out Rack 2 No IMG. On March 26, 2017, Skits was streaming New Game Plus No IMG attempts on his Twitch channel. His current PB was a 2748, just two seconds off the world record. Skits had been playing hard since GDQ, but today was a bit different. Today, he felt it. By the time Skids reaches Barlow, he's maintaining a four-second lead. On the first lap of this race, Skids has an inopportune run-in with the critter on the tracks. Keeping his composure, he's able to finish the race, but loses more than five seconds. He gets back a few seconds on no tack. Skids thought he could have gotten a gold on the split, but he decided to play it safe. After losing a little bit of time on Siberius and Tabora, Skits gets a fast load on Dabo, which earns him a gold split. Saving time on Tadano, Bolden, Aranos 2, and Gorn, Skits is now on pace for a 27-38. As he puts it himself, I guess I don't have to go super yellow, but I want to. This is the culmination of all his hard work. A chance to wipe the slate clean an opportunity to have his name above the title. All he has to do is clutch it out. Let's go. Oh my God, dude. Oh my God, I felt it today, dude. I knew I felt it today. Oh my God. It's over. Better late than never, Skits showed the world that he was a top-notch player. It was a long-fought battle, but he came out on top and reclaimed his honor. Ending on a high note, Skits took a break from Rack 2 as well. Now, there weren't any big-name players running the category, but the size of the community was growing. More and more players were branching out to other Ratchet games, and a solid community of players was developing. The advanced movement that was new and innovative just a few years ago was now the standard. As Ratchet speedrunning gained more popularity, more new players would also be drawn to the flashy movement and the high-octane experience that was the original Rack Trilogy. Over the next few months, two important names joined the scene. Yoshi Pro, also known as YP, and Scott Obozo. YP is a very prolific speedrunner, who holds top times in over 50 different games. While it could be argued that some of YP's speed games err on the side of obscure, YP's dedication and passion for speedrunning cannot be questioned. YP spent the first half of 2017 climbing the New Game Plus ladder, until he took the top spot in June. With his sights now set on no IMG, he was ready to go for the gold. He was a, he was a Rack 2 runner. Uh, but he runs everything. Like if you look at his speedrun.com page, he's got at least games on there. And I'm pretty sure he's at the top of the leaderboards for most games. And he's good at every one of them. Like YP is one of the best speedrunners there is. On August 27th, YP snags the world record for himself. With a 27-21, YP takes a decisive victory over Skits' time. But he wasn't done there. Later that week, YP got a 27-15. Even without any new noteworthy changes, YP cleaned up his gameplay and pushed the record a bit further. With this run, YP added yet another trophy to his vast collection and was happy to move on to a new game. We've spent a bit of time talking about YP, but where was Scotto Bozo? Scotto generally doesn't like to run categories that everyone else is playing, preferring to take the road less traveled by. While Zem and YP were racing each other in No IMG, Scotto was practicing a miscellaneous category called New Game Plus No Specials. What made this category interesting was that it banned the use of the Specials menu, the same menu that granted access to the Insomniac Museum as well as First Person Mode. Some runners felt that the No IMG category relied too heavily on wrench climbing and was seen as lame and not interesting. This feeling was so strong that it drove potential runners away from the category. But 
Without access to wrench climbing, runners in no specials had to get creative if they wanted to navigate the levels quickly. Fortunately, Scotto had an ace up his sleeve. There was a little known technique that would help runners gain a crazy amount of height fairly quickly. This method was known as proxies. A proxy is a way to translate horizontal momentum up a steep slope. So long as there is any noticeable slant to a wall, less than 85 degrees or so, players can maneuver into it and launch themselves to the top. Without getting too technical, runners could charge at a slope and then cancel that charge by throwing a decoy. While holding down circle, Ratchet's throwing animation somehow lets him slide up the slope with the momentum of the charge, letting players climb up pretty steep slopes without having to switch to first person. This was Scotto's saving grace. Proxies were just pretty much coming out of the wetworks, uh, and everybody was saying like, oh, you can't go over, this is too hard. His wall climbing was so easy, so of course the skill floor was at the lowest it could be for the game. And then when we added proxies, it was like, Oh, what, oh, well, this is this is kind of difficult. And Scotto was one of the first people to be like, "Yeah, I'm doing all of it. Like, I'm do, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep throwing stuff at the wall until it sticks. You know, I'm gonna try every one of these proxies, see what I can do." While proxies were known about, they weren't easy, and the community didn't know where they could fit into the route. They already had wrench climbing, so why bother? Well, since Scotto was playing no specials, he didn't have a choice he was going to need to get intimately familiar with these proxies if he was going to run this category. So, he did. Together with another runner, Super Squonk, the two spent hours searching for and routing in proxies. With new proxies discovered on planets like Eranos, Siberius, Tabora, and Snivelak, Scotto was making major strides in this odd side category. So major, Scotto's no special times were quickly approaching no IMG's world record. As it turned out, proxies could replace a majority of the wrench climbs in the route. The biggest thing that ever happened for Rack 2 speedrunning was when we really discovered the potential of the decoy movement. Because originally the decoy was used, you would do it to jump in midair, or you would do it to turn a corner sharply. But then we kind of realized that, you know, it, we went from, we would have a couple strats where you would charge and throw a decoy and you kind of slide up a slope, and then from there, we learned that you could proxy, and proxies kind of, proxies really changed the game. Like, they kind of changed everything. In November, after pushing the no specials record down, Scotto had what it took to grab the no IMG record. All he needed to do was make a few adjustments to his no specials route to work in a few wrench climbs that were faster. For Scotto, this was going to be easy. Scotto started doing runs of no IMG, and after only 14 attempts, Scotto cleanly took the record for himself. Even still, Scotto felt that 14 attempts was too many. In no time, Scotto also got himself a 2648 on November 27, 2017. At this point, Scotto's run looked strikingly different from the records that had come before. Where most runners spent around half the run in first person and use wrench climbs on most planets, Scotto only went into first person four times. Getting to spend more time in third person meant Scotto had more freedom with his movement and spent less time fiddling with the specials menu. It also turned out that proxies were way faster, not that hard, and there were actually plenty of places to do them. Before we continue, we need to take a detour. At this point in time, Zem92 was the biggest name in Rack speedrunning. He had shown off the games on the biggest of GDQ stages, became the most popular partnered streamer in the community, and held world records in nearly every game and category. Zem was a high-stylin', limousine riding, charge boot flying, wheelin' and dealin' son of a gun. As his popularity grew, so too did his ego. As mentioned earlier, Zem's demeanor did not win him many friends amongst the community, but the audience was eating it up. To the onlookers, Zem was a spectacle. To other runners, he was the ultimate enemy. Scott Oboza would frequently hang out in Zem's chat, mainly so he could remind Zem to fulfill his sub-goal promises and distract him with silly questions. All in good fun, of course. But Scott o started stirring the pot a bit. Yeah, I just remember Scotto was just this like at at, a, at the time when he was getting good and he was capable of beating Zem, he would 
make some smug remarks about Zem's uh, just areas of not being quite optimal or just like criticizing his play or any post that in his chat or his YouTube or anything like that. And Zem will, would always have this like kind of overreaction, I'd say. Scott and I didn't really see eye to eye a whole lot back then. And we kind of got into a lot of heated arguments. There was, there was a very long standing uh, rival. It was, it was not, it was a rivalry, but it was not friendly. Like we were very much like in some ways, like we would go out of our way to make the other one feel bad. It was mostly that I was being a, like a big stream monster in his chat most of the time. You know, I was just saying sort of mean things, asking him dumb questions about when he's going to do this sub goal that he promised among tens of other sub goals that he promised. And I left the mean comments on one of his YouTube videos where he did any percent trifecta. And that was like, I was like berating him for getting world record from someone else who used PS2 for all of the runs when PS3 is much faster for all of them now. Yeah, he didn't take that too kindly. Like I, I remember, uh, I think I did at the time like a, a New Game Plus trifecta run, or I think it was trifecta any percent. I believe that's what it was. And I ended up beating the previous world record holder by a pretty substantial amount. It was Toe Hobbit. What ended up happening was, it was total war after Scotto made a comment about how, like, I basically only really got uh, any percent trifecta because I ran Ratchet 1 on PS3 and Toe Hobbit ran on PS2. And, and PS3 is, like, significantly faster than PS2. And uh, I remember at that point, uh, the gloves were off for a very, very long time. We, we were not friends, uh, and, and we caused a lot of tension in the community. During his runs, Scotto pointed out that he was doing tricks that Zem couldn't do, and called Zem a fraud for taking world records from PS2 runners with his faster PS3. Eventually, Zem got fed up. Zem went in for the kill shot. Since Scotto had revolutionized the no specials route in order to innovate on the game, Zem picked up the category as well. In an effort to flex on and dominate Scotto's stomping grounds, Zem started taking records left and right. Zem pushed the no specials record down to a 2647, which was so fast, it was also faster than the no IMG world record as well. <laughs> With the most clutch needle of all time, dude. Holy shit. That was definitely a gold needle. I have to see. Woo! Esgueria. Thank you for the 500. Oh my god, I yoked myself like a fucking madman. Of course, since Scotto doesn't like to play the category that other top runners are playing, Scotto wasn't putting up much of a fight. With free reign, Zem spent the rest of December tearing through no IMG. After a few small PBs, Zem pulled out a 2555 on Christmas Eve. No fucking way. No fucking way. No fucking way. <laughs> a week later, on New Year's Day, Zem finished a run in 2536, planting his flag on Scotto's game. Having made his point clear, Zem moved on to something else. Nobody could deny that there was beef on the proverbial grill. Zem had come into Rack 2 with little practice, and by the end of the month had wrapped up several world records. He didn't just get the world record in no IMG, he improved the world record by a full minute. A statement victory that would ring out. I can take any record I want, when I want. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I won't even lie, like, I would I would throw my, my log into the fire because I thought it was entertaining at the time. Uh, like, in the moment, like, I, I won't lie, I was entertained. Um, but that was a nasty beat. I don't know how many people go into that, but that was that was not as clean cut and resolved as fast as it actually was. But it's it's an interesting uh, sort of sort of timeline. I, I think Zem was more angry than Scotto for sure. If you look at what happened, as soon as the Grinch had come to steal Christmas from Scotto, he left. Zem just put Scotto on a poster. The ball was in Scotto's court. How would he respond? 
Scotto is a man of few words, and usually lets his actions do all the talking. Instead of talking a big game, he put his head down and got back to work. Okay, so I remember when Scotto came in, I mean, he was just like the most stark contrast to Zem. Like the no mic, all business, you know, straight to the point. I'm speedrunning this game fast. Uh, kind of a kind of a nerdy guy, I think. And and Zem was kind of just this like, you know, you know, bit outgoing, braggadocious, kind of in your face a bit uh, with, with it. Scotto was more tech heavy introverted kind of nerdy on that aspect and and i think that was a very very interesting contrast scotto was more than up to the challenge but his pb was a little ways away on march 23rd 2018 almost a year exactly after skits's 2726 scotto had a solid early game before he arrived on barlow losing seven seconds here scotto knows he's got a lot of time to save in the next split Going from plus 2.6 to minus 8.1 in a single split, the train is back on the tracks. With green splits on from Notak to Tadano, including a beautiful Tabora, Scotto comes up big on Bolden, jumping out to a 16 second lead. With a heap of time to save on Aronos 2, Scotto adds on to his lead. Now 24 seconds ahead of his PB, world record is within striking distance. Scotto maintains this lead through Snivelak and adds 9 seconds more on top of it with a good smog. Closing out the end of the run 25 seconds ahead of his PB, this run should have been world record. In fact, it could have been. Were it not for the long loads that Scotto got during his run that Zem didn't, this would have been world record. Scotto lost the title fight to loading screens. You see, one of the problems with real-time was that loads were inconsistent across different runners and different setups. For one reason or another, runners could get long loads in their run and lose time for something outside of their control. Essentially, when going between planets in the first few Ratchet games, the duo is shown flying through space for a few screen transitions until they arrive at their destination. However, if the game needs more time to load, either because of slow disk readers or slow memory cards, the game will show an additional flying scene, which adds about 4 seconds every time. Scotto knew his gameplay was better than Zem's, and wanted to come back and definitively beat his time from before. Even after moving on, Zem was seemingly still taunting Scotto from beyond the veil. Scotto was ready to put in the work to continue pushing the game, to push back on Zem's claim to the throne. Scotto worked on faster strats, like skipping the taxi on Notak to backtrack to the ship. Scotto had the skills in the strats. Now, he just had to put in the work. After six months of bouncing around from different categories, Scotto dials in on no IMG. In a karmic throwback to December, he just barely clutches out a 2535, beating Zem by one second. He officially had the title back, but this wasn't enough. Scotto had to keep pushing to prove Zem wrong. Two months later, Scotto had a breakthrough. On August 5th, Scotto crushed the record with a 2528. Not just winning on a technicality, but a resounding victory. Scotto reclaimed his champion's belt. He didn't let up though, as a few days later, he brought his time down to a 24.57, the first sub-25 minute run. While this was going on, the community was looking into the long loads problem, and came forward with a solution. The community would adjust the final times moving forward by taking off the additional 3.6, 3.7, or 4 second loading screen every time it occurred. Now, no one else would have to suffer the same fate that Scotto did. Almost as if in celebration of the new timing, Scotto gets yet another record, this time a 2445 without long loads. Eventually, Zem and Scotto would bury the hatchet, and are actually good friends now. In fact, Scotto is a mod in Zem's chat, where he can now be a nuisance with power. But at the time, you could have cut the tension with a knife. There was a serious beef between the two, but nothing motivates speedrunners quite like a good competition. This stint between Zem and Scotto was so fierce, it had most of the community on the edge of their seats. Together, Zem and Scotto pushed Rack 2 two whole minutes, almost exclusively through tighter and more refined gameplay. 
The rivalry between these titans was one of the best things to ever happen to Rack 2. See, I am aware of the beef that did go on there, which, as bad as it sounds, I think it was a good thing for the game because it ignited a lot of competition. Maybe not for the right reasons, but sometimes bad motivation can be motivation regardless. While Scotto had been grinding the category, other runners had risen through the ranks. As 2018 went on, new names were filling the top 10 spots on the leaderboard. Runners like Outrageous Josh, Sneepy, and Torpedo. There was one other who reigned above them, though. Alright, guys. Alright. You never knew you needed this much of me. Alright, so... Hailing from the land down under was a young man named Fear. Fear showed a lot of potential, but he was a real diamond in the rough. He would spend a lot of time running and practicing, but he struggled to finish his best runs, often cracking under the pressure before the end. Fear's main problems were focus and mentality. Anytime he was on a fast-paced run, Fear's mind was filled with thoughts of getting the world record. Instead of paying attention to the run in front of him, he was already dreaming of the glory at the finish line. It's a common thing that happens in speedrunning where people, uh, they don't take it one step at a time. They, they look too far ahead and uh, they make one little mistake they weren't prepared for because they weren't thinking about it. And they start to freak out and they lose all their time. And that would happen to fear constantly. And I'm not saying this to, to shit on him at all. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to paint the picture of how far he's come really uh, because he was a perpetual choke artist for months. He would always get so close and then like lose 15 or 20 seconds and then not be able to roll with the punches very well and then just totally lose his entire run and then beat himself up and then turn off stream. While Zem had long stood as the community's go-to bad guy, Zem had turned over a new leaf. Instead of bravado and machismo, Zem wanted to help elevate runners and give back to his favorite community. Seeing an opportunity to help a rising star, Zem reached out to Fear to help him out. No stranger to being under pressure, Zem wanted to help Fear master his mentality. In a similar act of mentorship, Scotto also wanted to help out Fear. Together, Zem and Scotto worked with Fear to set him on the right path going forward. And uh, this, is, this is where I say that I kind of take on more of a, of a spiritual mentor role at this point. Because uh, now that Scott and I have buried our hatchets and we're actually friends now, uh, and fear is is coming through. I'm I'm noticing that there is like both of these guys. Th pretty much their biggest issues is is kind of just like again keeping up with the grind. Like they're they're both becoming more and more technically proficient as the days roll by. But I, I'm starting to notice that like you know in crucial moments they'll like choke runs in certain spots or like fear will get particularly down on himself. And so I kind of try to make it my goal to uh, help these guys you know, solidify their mentality a little bit more, mostly with fear. I, I remember with fear and also with another runner named Torpedo, my, my goal was to kind of help them like steady their emotions and kind of do what I could to see them turn to the runners that I, I kind of see that they could be. Instead of fighting over no IMG world records, Zem and Scotto were now fighting over who could be the most helpful to fear. Nothing was off the table for them. Hours of late night conversations, one-on-one -on -one training, in-depth discussions, and more. They were going to give Fear the best training possible. Meanwhile, Scotto had been on the hunt for some new time saves. Devising a new route for the Mactar jamming array, Scotto had an easy 8-second time save ready to go. On November 25th, 2018, Scotto had a 2422 with loads removed. Now, Scotto knew there was enough time saved to easily go for a 23 minute time. Instead of taking the glory for himself, however, Scotto saw a coaching moment. In an unprecedented display of sportsmanship, Scotto refused to continue running the category until Fear took the world record from him. Scotto was stepping back and giving his competitor a solid chance to prove he had what it took. The stage was set. And so then after that, I was like really trying to cheer on Fear because he wasn't able to get it when the record was 25. So I was like, come on, Fear, you got to get it now. And so I sort of stepped away from no IMG for a while. With Scott Abozo kind of just like wiping the floor with everyone right now, uh, I remember what happened was he lowered world record to like mid 24 
and he knew the record could go lower. He absolutely did. But he he was, you know, at this point, we're kind of turning over a new leaf in the community. We're, we're trying to be much more inclusive and we're trying to be much more like rooting people on rather than tearing each other down. I think all this time of drama and, and cutthroat competition really uh, took its toll on us. And so it, we very much are trying to encourage people to be at their best. And so I know for a fact that Scott knew he could improve his time, but he wanted to step away from the game for a while and remove himself from the equation so that fear could also now in turn grow into the speedrunner that Scott and I both knew that he could be. And um, so essentially Scott steps away. He's like, I'm not coming back to the game until fear beats my time. Fear wasn't ready to take up the challenge. Not yet, anyways. Well, the good pace I had is now uh, gone. It was a stupid mistake. Fear needed to sharpen his skills a bit before he had a shot at taking the record. With the two best Rack 2 runners in the world to guide him, Fear was getting better at handling his mentality. Starting in 2019, Fear bounced back and forth between NG Plus and No IMG, slowly bringing his times down. Since NG Plus was essentially late game No IMG practice, Fear looked at this as just more training for the real deal. In February, Fear got his first 24 minute time, a 24.52. While he was still 30 seconds behind Scotto, Fear was finally in a position to be able to contend for the world record. While Fear kept grinding, his improvement slowed down. He wasn't getting PBs left and right like he used to, and dropping runs was getting to his head. Fear kept at it though, determined to learn how to keep his composure. In June, after a short break, Fear was ready to come back in full force. On a chill June stream, Fear is doing no IMG attempts while chatting with his friend and running mate Torpedo. Fear starts yet another run. Running against his old PB from February wasn't easy, as his 24-52 had a pretty solid early game. As such, Fear's run starts out in the negative, as small mistakes start to add up. Fighting against his inclination, Fear chooses not to reset this run, and instead see it to the end. He even loses 10 seconds on Feltzen to a fourth try nuke storage, but he still keeps on trucking. Without much success up until Snivelak, Zem pops into the chat. With a simple, you got this, Fear knows that his mentor and friend is watching intently, cheering on his homie from the sidelines. While Fear's PB had a solid early game, Fear choked the run on Smolg and lost 30 seconds. This time around, Fear had a massive chunk of time to save, his only redemption on this tight run. Without hesitation, Fear takes on the Smolg rail at full speed. He cleanly clears this hurdle and leaves the planet 12 seconds in the green. This was it. In the chat, Zem's words ring out. This moment is yours, Fear. Taking hold of his destiny, Fear pulls a 24-20 from the jaws of defeat. Let's freaking go, dude! I split late! <laughs> Let's go! <laughs> That's probably world record. I think I got more than 10 seconds of long loads. I'm pretty sure that's world record. Let's go, dude. I'm shaking so much right now. Oh my god. Oh. After months of practicing, Fear had done it. Fear claimed his first world record in the category. Now that he was the newly crowned champion, Fear was going to have to defend his title. The next month, the Ratchet community was gearing up for their annual Ratchet Relay Race, where teams of players would race an assortment of Ratchet games and categories. In preparation for the event, runners are racing and de-rusting no IMG. Fear even gets another PB with the 24-10. It's over boys! New world record, let's go. Let's go! Three world uh, three long loads. Finally, dude! Let's go! Took its time to do it again. Woo! It's world record! During this practice period, runner and glitch hunter Mantodia gets frustrated with the planet Wupash. The objective on Wupash is to clear out all the enemy ships. 
Up until this point, runners would fly at the sun for a short time, and then turn around and shoot a nuke at the enemies on their tail. This would usually leave runners with three or four stragglers to clean up. But Manto was tired of cleaning up the last four ships. Manto wanted a new setup that would kill them all. I found something because I, I hated the setup for it. Um, there's, there's a video that's called three drop setup and it is just ridiculous because it made no sense to me and uh i, I hated it i i absolutely loathed this rat and i had to do it at the gdq uh, relay and i was just like i don't want to do this i don't want to do this i i'm not going to do it i'm going to find something else i'm going to find something just out of brute anger so what i did is i just i just decided like to step back and think about how this worked and why it worked so i just i i went as far away from the enemies as i could and i got a one drop and then i was like oh my god and then i got it again and then i got a zero drop and i was like i, I gotta get everybody in here so i, I called up uh fear and scotto and we labbed it out for a while and this was like right before the gdq marathon having found a consistent setup for this quick kill manto shares his findings with the community the day before the relay race instead of turning around and flying towards the sun manto found that flying downwards at this constellation set up all the enemies for this quick kill the night before the relay, runners were able to fine-tune the maneuver. Scotto and Fear are feverishly practicing this new zero-drop trick as it saved up to 10 seconds and was way more consistent. During a practice run for this, Scotto gets on a pretty good run but misses the zero-drop. Unfazed, Scotto keeps going and the run just keeps saving time. Almost without meaning to, Scotto drops a 23.55 on July 5th, 2019, sneaking in a cheeky world record just in time for the relay. While Scotto was the first person to get a 23 minute time, Fear wasn't going to give up. After the relay, Scotto moved on to other things, and Fear was left to his own devices. Following in his mentor's footsteps, Fear stepped through the entire route and re-examined every segment. Getting into the nitty gritty, Fear wondered, is it faster to do one or two side flips out of this hyper strike? Turn charge or wrench swing? Proxy or mega flip? Before the year was over, Fear had his record back with a 2345 on October 6th. I did, Rhino did pull out for a sec. I might have just cocked it. No, it's fine, it's over. It's over, boys! Let's go! Oh yes! Whew. I just lost all my splits by slamming my table and accidentally resetting, but that's okay! Woo! Oh yeah! But once again, Fear took another break after this run, vowing to return in the new year. While Fear was working on NG Plus around April, Mantodia was still hard at work finding new strats for the run. Manto had noticed that sometimes normal bosses die faster than usual and wanted to investigate the cause. What he found out was, certain weapons like the hover bomb deal more damage and can shoot faster if the gun's model is inside of the boss. The community dubbed this phenomenon poking. Manto wasn't quite sure if this strat would be very helpful, but Fear insisted they try it out. I started using the hover bomb for the bosses more because I always thought it did a lot of damage, and I was always confused why we only used it in Max percent and like Hundo, and we just didn't use it a lot. And I noticed something: it was that if you shove the gun into the boss, it wouldn't put it up in the air like it normally does against a wall. Or when he walks up to a wall, he'll put it up in the air, just for added realism, I guess. Uh, but when a, when he walks up to a boss, he doesn't do that. So you'll notice the bombs don't even have a chance to spawn, but the damage does, and it also uncaps the fire rate. So you can just start dealing mass damage to a boss. One day, Fear was like, all right, let's just find it. Like, like there's got to be something here. Let's just spend like two hours. And I had an essay due, so I was like, I was in full panic mode. And I was just like, all right, let's just, let's just do it. Like, let's get it over with. And um, so I was like, here's what we do. We're just going to charge at him and... It was messy at first. We were like trying a bunch of different things and then we noticed it and we noticed how fast it killed it. And then we were just like, oh, we have we have something on our hands now. Uh, we have a loaded gun. Um, there's a lot we could do route wise for this. Like it's ridiculously powerful. And then and then the crazy thought came in my head 
and I was like, oh, I gotta do this essay. Um, but what if we killed the Snivelak boss with the hover bomb? And it was like, oh my god. For years, runners were taking upwards of 35 seconds to kill the boss on Snivelak with the Sheepinator gun. Since the boss has a lot of health, shooting it with normal weapons takes a long time and a lot of ammo. The Sheepinator was an exception because it doesn't use ammo and just needed time to transform the enemy into a sheep. But with poking, it was possible to deal heavy damage very quickly. Fear spent dozens of hours that week messing around with the Snivelak boss trying to manipulate it into a specific position. Runners knew it was possible to get the boss stuck on this bridge here without breaking it apart. After several days, Fear found it, a fast and reliable setup that let him poke the gigantic boss. From here, Fear could stand on the bridge and be protected from the boss's attacks, giving him free reign to blast away. Fear makes his glorious return to No IMG in June of 2020. Having practiced the Snivelak boss fight for the NG Plus category, he was ready to implement this strat into the run. On June 14th, Fear gets a new best time of 2341, just barely beating his previous time. Yeah, good. Poking would have failed there because I got bad part of it, RNG. Dude, I just got world record. That's world record. <laughs> Let's go! <laughs> oh, holy! I don't actually, dude. That was one of the craziest clutches of my life. Holy, dude! But after hours of practice and grinding, Fear was back into shape. Only a week later, Fear pulls out another crazy run, a twenty-three thirty-two. Oh my God! No way! Yes! <laughs> Yo, nice. <laughs> oh, yes! I had like... I had an over 10 seconds of long loads there. That's 3x. Easy. Still not satisfied, Fear goes back for thirds. On July 2nd, Fear got a 2331, only a 1 second improvement. Fear was hitting a wall again. For most runners, it's hard to keep grinding down a time when you start seeing diminishing returns. In times like these, Fear opts to switch back and forth between NG Plus and No IMG. Since the NG Plus run is essentially just the last third of the No IMG route, Fear's skill sets transfer between the two quite nicely. After this 2331, Fear decided to dive headfirst into NG Plus. NG Plus was always seen as this like offshoot of No IMG. It's like, yeah, it's just the end game of no IMG and so you'd always have the no IMG runners also being the top NG plus runner. It was usually the same holder and it still is, but it usually always was the same holder um, because it was just the late game and literally you'd just get people that would just grind it to practice. And I know I just went over to NG plus for a bit because I was having issues with my late game. And so I just went, hey, I'll go play NG plus, get a good late game and come back. Since NG Plus is a shorter category, runners feel more comfortable going for riskier tricks, usually reserved for individual level speedruns. Fear was going to push this category to the limit and go for the craziest tricks the community knew about. Fear was ready to implement mid-air charges. Known about for years, mid-air charges were thought to be impossible to work with in real time. While using the charge boots in the air, there's a one frame window when the initial charge runs out, where players can implement a new charge. This significantly increases the distance that Ratchet can travel while mid-air, even allowing for new shortcuts. Mid-air charges are ridiculously hard to pull off consistently, unless of course, you're Fear. Fear had developed his own technique that made it pretty consistent for him. The main thing that Fear has been implementing is the midair charges where you you cancel the charge boots in midair and then you charge again and it's a frame perfect trick but it's actually like something you can sort of time with your own button inputs as frame perfect it's not like nuke storage where you shoot the nuke you have to wait almost exactly one second and then pause it's not like that kind of blind luck and so fear put in a ton of work to get consistent with those and he's found like several double charge strats throughout the run. Fear is one of the only people to use this method, and he's also the best runner at performing them. 
If anyone was going to start using this trick in runs, Fear would be the one to do it. Um, the main difference, like the only thing I can really say is the main difference between like Scotto and Fear is Fear has absolutely, well, no, uh, yeah, no fear. He'll just, he'll just go for the strat. He'll go for it as fast as possible. And if he fails it, he'll reset the run and go again. Like he doesn't really set things up. He doesn't take un, like quote unnecessary steps. He'll just press the go fast button and he'll go fast. And if he dies, he'll reset. He doesn't really take the extra precautions to maybe clutch out a PV, aside from maybe in the last few splits. But until then, he'll just go as fast as humanly possible. Um, and that's what sets Fear apart from all the other runners, is that he will do the hardest strats no matter what, no matter when. And he will try and execute them as fast as possible. Fear went to work practicing all of these new segments. With mid-airs, Fear's segments were the best times the community had ever seen, literally. The Ratchet community keeps track of all the best ever segments for every category, and Fear was putting his name on almost every segment. It was time to take the NG Plus record down to uncharted territory. But I also, at this point, I, I wanted to do what all the other NG Plus record holders had done, which was hold NG Plus, no IMG, and NG Plus. But I'd never held NG Plus. And it was like this mental block where I felt like my late game was worse, even though I had all the com builds kind of thing. And I was like, I, I just couldn't do it. And so I was like, I need to do both if I want to get better at no IMG. And so I sat down and frankly, NG Plus got closer to what I considered a more crazy goal, a uh, goal, sorry. So that's really what I focused on. And I went, because the world record at the time was 8.36. And I just really wanted to beat it. I just had this drive and it came. I had a bit of free time for a while. So I was streaming. It was like 12 hours a day or like it was like 10 to 12 hours a day. And I was just looking for strats. I was doing runs. I was practicing. After grinding these new tricks and crazy segments, Fear had an iron will. Practicing for two hours a day, then streaming attempts for six more, Fear is sharpening the axe hard, but his improvements are apparent. Fear already had the NG Plus record with an 827 from back in May, but within a week of doing runs, Fear had already saved 13 seconds. A week later, he had saved 13 more. Uh oh, bad RNG, bad RNG, we're fine. Oh! <gasps> yes! Let's go! Oh! As an 8 minute speedrun, the route is insanely optimized, but Fear's mid-air strats were saving several seconds even still. Now 30 seconds ahead of his closest competition, Fear was untouchable, but he was still hungry for more. The 7 minute time. Fear's mentality is no longer holding him back. In fact, he was more powered up than ever before. In a sense, Fear had conquered Fear. He was unstoppable. Fear grinded out runs for over a month, until it finally happened. The run starts off pretty average. After skipping most of the game to get to the museum, Fear manages to clear Bolden pretty smoothly. After everyone's least favorite part of the run, the clank section, things pick up speed. As Ratchet, Fear immediately clips out of bounds and does a double charge under the level, then quickly switches to first person. Skipping the inside of the station, Fear quickly makes it to the landing pad and escapes from Aranos in record time. Gorn goes all according to plan, and it's off to Snivelak. Here, Fear does his setup to get the big boss stuck, without even having to look at his handiwork. On Smolg, Fear blasts through the shipping crates and gracefully flies across the tightrope. After a quick stop on Grelbin, Fear is heading into the final stage. Everything goes right, a first try clip through the doors, a perfect setup to get out of bounds, and a fast poke on the final boss. And one of the most astounding Ratchet 2 runs ever completed, Fear clutches out a 759 on September 5th, 2020, after accounting for long loads. This was Fear's magnum opus. This run was only 10 seconds behind the community's gold splits, the best segments ever recorded. It was truly an amazing run. Fear was proud of the work he'd done in his three years of speedrunning. 
Fear kind of took that mindset into NG+, where he's like, he was wanting to find every little time save he can. And let's just say, through nearly just Fear's own efforts, Seven went from TAS only, to RTA Pipe Dream, to Realistic, to Possible, to Achieved. Almost solely on Fear's efforts. The, the stuff that Fear does is insane. And he's just pulling out all the stops. He's double charging everywhere. The insta clip on Snivelak is insane. The insta clip on 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 Yidl is crazy. I mean, this guy is seriously like the best player of all time in this game. Like without a doubt, in my mind, anyway. How could Fear possibly follow this up? With all of the new mid-air charge strategies and just overall improvements to the route. Fear had yet to put the finishing touches on No IMG. Almost as if aware that a speedrun history video was being made about the category, Fear returned to No IMG with renewed vigor. Vowing to bring No IMG down to a 22 minute time, Fear got back to work. While not fully comfortable implementing every midair, Fear does add a midair charge on Uzla converting the second charge into a proxy jump to get out of bounds faster than the old decoy clip. Now, sharper than ever, Fear jumps back into no IMG. In less than a week, Fear is matching his previous record. On November 28th though, Fear pulled a run together in 23-28, just slightly faster than the previous record. I am 90% sure this is world record, dude. Dude, that was the clutchest late game of my life, dude. Holy crap. That late game genuinely might have been better than the sub-8 late game. Holy crap, dude. Later that day, Fear gets a much cleaner 2308, and that's where the record stands today. While this wasn't quite the 22 he was aiming for, it was still a very solid time. Fear has yet to truly push the no IMG category to its limits. Even now, Fear is confident that a sub-23 is clearly possible for the longer category. As he continues to hone his craft, Fear will strive to bring Rack 2 under his total control. And and to this day, I mean, I, I still believe he easily has the best movement, at least as far as NG plus categories are concerned. Yeah, he really did the work. He, he didn't cut any corners and he sat down and he grinded as often as he could. And he would uh, make very concerted efforts to not beat himself up as much. And it culminated in him lowering the barrier more and more uh, of what we considered possible. Fear's use of mid-air charges is revolutionizing the IL strategies for the run. Since Fear is far and away the best runner at performing these charges, Fear is the perfect person to go for these tricks during full game runs. As of the release of this video, Fear is practicing an insane clip on Tabora that involves a mid-air charge, which saves a ridiculous 7 seconds. Rack 2 isn't the only game being improved by mid-air charges either. Fear's push for proxies and double charges is trickling down into Ouya as well. For the first time in its history, Rack 2 was developing tech that the other games could learn from, not the other way around. Because of his dedication, Fear is bringing Ratchet speedrunning into a new era. It's been a long journey, but a glorious new dawn awaits. The game that started out as the run to the litter has grown to maturity. Through the work of dedicated runners, showboaters, and mentors, a strong community has formed around Ratchet and Clank 2. Should you find yourself in the community of Rack 2 runners, you'll quickly notice a few things. Their strong sense of camaraderie, their lighthearted nature, and their passion for their game. Should you choose to join them, you'll join the ranks of one of the best communities in all of speedrunning. But be warned, if you plan to take the crown, you'll have a tough time taking it from the king. Because the only thing to fear is fear himself.
Hey, thanks for watching our video. If you want to join the community, check out our Discord. Also, consider supporting us on Patreon. It really helps. Thanks.